Hello my friends, it is the 1st of February and uh, I feel compelled that I have to make a personal testimonial type video. Um, there are a small number of people who are saying derogatory things about me and trying to blacken my name and I am compelled to tell you guys the truth about me. Um, there's a lot of things about my life that I try to keep hidden um, because they're very traumatic. Life <clears throat> is like a book and there are certain chapters you open and certain chapters you don't open. So reluctantly I am going back into my past that I tr try to hide from me and many other people. So chapter one is my academic career. and. Uh, <clears throat> When I was growing up in a wee small six acre farm outside Border Down, black and white TV, one of my favourite programmes was David Attenborough, wildlife programmes. I just totally loved him, loved him, loved him. And he was a big in <coughs> inspiration of me wanting to become a biologist. Went to Col I started university in Coleraine in 1970 and I graduated in 1974, <coughs> 1974 with an honours degree in biology. Let me see that. You'll be able to see that. Yeah, you can. 1974, honours degree in biology. <clears throat> the next year I went to Queen's, did a diploma in education, because at this stage I realised I wanted to become a biology teacher. And uh, graduate, I got my diploma in education, then I started teaching the Christian Brothers Grammar School in Armagh, where I became head of biology. In 1979 I saw an advert <clears throat> in the Belfast Telegraph for a part-time master's degree uh, aimed at teachers. Um, it was a uh, part-time master's degree in contemporary biology and biochemistry at the new university of ulster and it uh, the course started at six o'clock on a friday so it was aimed for teachers six o'clock on a friday uh, saturday from nine to one and sometimes sunday so i went to my headmaster and asked him would it be okay if i enrolled for that because anything i do i always want to be the best at it and i said listen i want to be the best biology teacher in ireland and i think if i got my master's degree in contemporary biology it would be most Contemporary means up to date, uh, and it might help me become a better teacher. And then you said, I'm all for it, then no problem, it'll be great. So, teachers have roughly six free periods per week, and my headmaster kindly arranged for me to have three of my free periods. He arranged it, he rearranged my time timetable for me, very nice of him. So, with my Friday afternoons, the three periods were, were the, my three, three free periods. So, at one o'clock, I left school and drove straight to Coleraine, and uh, <coughs> Went to my lectures and stayed over in digs along to my ex students. It was great. Just went back at uni again. Even played a, first, a couple of games of football for the university. Old Tom Stark, my old manager, he used to be my manager, and uh, I played a couple of games. That's four or five games for the uh, thirds and fourths. I wasn't, I wasn't fit, but I enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. So in nineteen and eighty two, I graduated with a master's degree. Yeah master's degree in contemporary biology yeah and this is me 1982 yeah and those of you who have been to graduation ceremonies you'll notice that all the big knobs are all up at the front row the people getting phds doctorates uh, master's degrees and uh, honorary degrees they're all up in the front row and there i was in the front row and sitting beside me, I could not believe it, I could not believe it, sitting beside me was David Attenborough. I could not believe it, I could not believe it. And there was no uh, mobile phones in them days, and uh, it was, I couldn't take a selfie, but that was fantastic. That was fantastic. So, um, 1988, the, Saint, the Christian Brothers Grammar School amalgamated with St. Patrick's College in Armagh to form one big new school called St. Patrick's Grammar School. And this would be this was the start of them days. This was my, this was the, uh, Julio. There was me there with a lovely master's degree. Mr. L. Mulholland, BSc, MSc, DipEd, C. Biologist, Chartered Biologist, MI Biologist, member of the Institute of Biology. <coughs> so that was me in 1988. And the movement was going great. Chapter two, my burger business. 1989, the, uh, my mate and I were walking to uh, the pits, the Northwest. The Northwest 200 is one of my most favorite weekends in all the world. 
never miss it. And see, it's going to be cancelled again this year. It's heartbreaking for me and lots of other people. So we were walking up from the harbour up to, to York Corner and uh, halfway up the road, up that road, and a wee little front concrete garden with these students with a 40 gallon drum cut in two and their barbecue and burgers. It smelled lovely. I ate two and sort of my mate. We walked on up to the York Corner to walk on up the road to the pits and the siren come nee, 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 and that was the road closed car coming down which meant everybody had to go off the road and go onto the uh, the golf course and walk up along the sea up towards the pits a mile long and I noticed there wasn't one food bar anywhere on that, on that section of the circuit they were all over at the York Corner end and I said to my mate boy if them people that wee burgers thing in there they make a fortune so three months later I was up playing golf in Port Stewart our wee golf uh, our soccer club had a wee golf in society and we used to play in Port Stewart Golf Club. That was our that was our circuit, our course. And uh, when I was up there, I bumped into James, the secretary, who sort of half knew me. And I put the proposal to him, can I put a wee burger stall up on the golf course, the next Northwest, and I'll give you 50 quid towards the club or whatever. He said, not a problem, Liam, as long as you keep the place clean. And I said, not a bother, I'll put bin or bins out and I'll gather up all the rubbish. I'll keep it strict and span. So the next year, I put a wee burger stall up. On that spot where the where the road when the where they learn the steps onto the onto the uh, tennis courts onto the golf course the old golf course and I made a complete fortune. The next year I put another one up halfway up the course. Now I'm not there anymore, but where am I? <laughs> there maybe some of you some you might recognise the wee stall that was my little burger stall, and you see the sea in the background. So that was that, and it was great. Now listen, the reason. The reason I needed the burgers was, I mean, I had moved into a brand new private development in Port of Iron, just off the Gawaki Road, and a brand new house, big mortgage, new furniture, his paid for the car, usual stuff. I was the only breadwinner in our house. I had a three and four year old kid, and my wife was a stay at home mum. So I was the only income, I was the only earner. So I needed something to supplement the income, and this was the burgers did it for me. I used to be, uh, I used to pay for Port of Iron Club in my, before I went to uni. I only made two two uh, appearances for the first team and I was only, I was only 18 at the time. So uh, I got my little burger stall put up to Shamrock Park and I was there selling burgers at Shamrock Park and I had a little trolley in the back of, and I put it in the back of the van. And when Portadown were playing away, all the different grounds, I'd be there before the supporters' buses. I'd be there an hour before and the burgers were all cooked. So when the supporters got off the buses, they would buy burgers off me because they all knew me, blah, blah, blah. I'd go and watch the match and come back and the students, I got my students to to do the burger swing and they loved it they loved it didn't you students and uh, it was great and it was good i even went down to lansdowne road to the rugby matches i would go to do the ulster grand prix i'm going to show you something here you mightn't like this my little son david and the burger stall up at the pits the cookstown 100 i got little david a job it's my son david cleaning cameron donald a new kid on the block from australia called cameron donald and uh, he was riding, and David now became his. Now he is a couple of years later. Those of you who know about motorbikes, number eighty six, Cameron Donald. David he used to clean the visors. Yeah, now they starting them young. Anyway, that one good. Chapter three is the one I don't like talking about. I'm even shaking now talking about it. Something that very few people know about me. Uh, 1992, uh, I, I had a lab and a wee prep room behind it. Sorry, prep room onto the lab and in the prep room was a phone. At half three, one day in September, the phone rang and it was somebody identifying himself as a Mr. Gilpin. And he told me I, I made a lot of money selling burgers and I would need some protection. And that I thought it was a joke and he said, this is no joke. You make a lot of money and we think you need some protection. And if you don't give it to us, we'll kill you. And uh, I, he was looking for the equivalent of five thousand pounds in today's money, and he told me I'd ring you in tomorrow, and you better have the money. Blah blah blah. And I didn't have the money, so I went straight to the police. Like after school, and they, they said to me, "This is out of our league. We're going to have to call in the big guns." So they called in Unit C One Three from Knocknagoni in Belfast, the anti racketeering squad. And I met them at half eight that night, Porter Down Police Station, and they told me, "Listen, two detectives said them." We deal with nothing, only Republican loyalist, uh, paramilitary, regatarian. This is from our experience as someone who knows you well, someone who lives close to you, he knows all your movements, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, he's phoning me again tomorrow. I'm going to tape him. So I taped him. I got a little dictaphone and I taped the bugger. 
And to cut a long story short, the detective said, keep stalling, stalling, stalling to retry and catch him. So I kept taping him and every time I got the tape, I, I give it to the police. And after about a week and a half, uh, I said to myself, the police are doing nothing here. I'll do my own investigation. So I done a lot of in, in Sherlock Holmes investigation. And I discovered after a couple of days that it was the local unit of the IRA in Portadown who were doing it. Told the police who it was, mentioned the name, the three names, and they said, Great, we'll get them. And nothing was done, nothing was done. And uh, I didn't pay, they kept phoning me and I wouldn't pay. And then about the phone calls stopped. And about two weeks later, I was putting the bin out one Saturday night, dark, dark October, November night. And uh, out from the shadows, out from the shadows, stepped this guy, this guy here. Put a gun to my chest. He said, uh, I hear you're going around saying we're trying to racketeer money off you. Uh, I'm holding them two boys over there from coming over and looking you. And if I hear any more word, I'll look you myself. And I frightened. I was frightened as hell. So I went to... Uh, I went... I went to the police, told them what had happened. And I said, are you sure? I said, yeah. So I was expecting them to arrest these guys. Nothing happened. Not a thing happened. And it's more or less day to death. But the police said, listen, you better check onto your car every morning before you go to school. Because them boys, if it, if it is who you say they are, um, we think them boys have killed before and have done robberies, but we just can't prove it. Hmm. So nothing was done. And on the 18th of the following July, Word came out on the news that three bodies were found on the South Armagh border, stripped naked with bullets in their heads. They were informers, and it was the three guys who were after me. And on a more sinister note, you're very well aware with the Lisa Dorian case that's going on. The little girl disappeared from the camp caravan site in Malaya. Well, a young lady had disappeared from Portadown. She had an affair with this guy. And she had been missing now for 14 months. Nobody knew where she was. So after the two days after the Mountain News, them guys were found on the border, a rap came to my front door and this guy with a lovely English accent said, Mr. Mulholland, I said, yes, it's me and I know who you are. He says, who? I said, you're Peter Taylor from Panorama. So you're one of the world's greatest investigative journalists, documentary makers, blah, blah, blah. So for some reason, you can get into the upper echelons of the UVF, the IRA, Middle East terrorists, drug dealers. You are trusted by them and you can get into places where MI5, MI6, the CIA and the FBI couldn't get in. He says, can I come in? He says, come on in, surely, give me a cup of tea. He said, listen, I'm going to make a documentary about what happened to you, and it's very, very uh, important that I do it. Um, will you cooperate? I said, well, come in, we'll talk about it. And I said to him, by the way, the word on the street is them guys could be innocent because normally the IRA make them do confessions, and there's been no confessions. He says, I have the tapes. I said, what? He said, the IRA give me the confession tapes. Oh, said I. Can you tell me some of the contents? Very long story. He said, well, basically, they broke down under interrogation in the IRA interrogation room and they said that they abducted the wee girl. They abducted the wee girl, took her to a forest in Mullock Moor in County Sligo, strangled her, buried her in a shallow grave, went back two weeks later, dug her up, and they removed masking tape that she had on her hands or afraid of fingerprints. They went back two weeks after that, dug her up for a second time, and with a, cl a club hammer, smashed her skull in and her teeth so she couldn't be identified in case somebody with a dog uh, act found the body. They also said, Liam, on the interrogation, they, they had planned to kill you on two occasions because you were on to them. And uh, it all made sense when they said that because the police told them. He said they were hoping for the police the whole time. And the police told them that you were on to them and they were going to kill you. So they were. And the sad thing is, the police knew they were going to kill the wee girl as well. The police were aware. They had told their handlers that they had to kill the wee girl because they thought she had overheard them planning a robbery. It's not a disgusting, dirty war we went through in this country. Yeah. Get away with murder. And that frightened the hell clean out of me. What I mean, I was bad my nerves. I mean, it was about three months after the, the first phone call, I had to go to my doctor and tell him, listen, that, I'm a nervous wreck. I'm up all night. I can't sleep. Every little noise I hear outside, I'm wondering, I'm looking through the curtains, I'm going out the back, I see the damn blah, blah, blah. So he said, Liam, you're suffering from depression. And he, 
He said, here's new tablets out in the block are called antidepressants, they'll help you. So he put me on these antidepressants and after two months, it made me worse. So he gave me another different brand and then another brand. And he said, listen, uh, you're very anxious, take these here. These are called diazepam or Volume. They will help you. I says, I can't sleep. He says, well, here, there are some sleeping tablets. And by, 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 by March, April, I was a flipping pharmaceutical junkie. I was a complete zombie junkie. And when Peter Taylor told me of the confession that they're going to shoot me, that put me clean crackers because I, I suffer from claustrophobia. I, I hit tight and closed spaces. And uh, I, had the, I started getting these nightmares of me being half shot, thrown in a shallow grave. Remember the, the, remember the Picky Blinders when they, when they, they shot the guy and into the grave? Whenever I saw that, the Picky Blinders, I, I freaked out because I have these nightmares of me being in a shallow grave, not killed, half dead, and then throwing the soil in and top me. I still get them nightmares. So anyway, uh, school started again the 1st of September of 93, and after a week, I went to my headmaster and I said, listen, I, uh, I'm a nervous wreck. Um, I've been hiding something from you from a long time. There's, there's, I've been hiding something from everybody. There's going to be a program coming out next week. Uh, Peter Taylor from Panorama is bringing out a, a, an hour-long program all about me and what happened to me. And I'm, I'm just telling you now before the programs are, and I'm, uh, I'm a nervous wreck. I'm no good for this school. Um, there's no point in me coming here to get money to pay a mortgage. The most important people in the school are the pupils. And I am a shit teacher. I am a, I am a rubbish teacher. I, if I can't give 100%, I'm no good. So all I'm giving now is 50%. And it's not good enough. And it's not fair on the kids. So I, am, I'm, I'm, I want to let you know I'm resigning as a teacher. I can't teach anymore. My teaching career is gone. My teaching vibes are all gone. So he tried to talk me out of it. And I said, no, I can't. My decision's made up. So he said, well, you stay at Christmas to get a replacement. And I said, yeah, I'll stay at Christmas. So I stayed to Christmas. And uh, where are we? Yeah. And on the next year's uh, school magazine, oh, I said to the headmaster, he says, what would we say the reason why you quit? We can't very well tell. I says, well, I don't want people to know the real reason why I quit because... Everywhere I go, they'll be stopping me and talking to me and ask me what happened, blah, blah, blah. I just a chapter of my life I won't completely erase. So just tell them I'm quitting school to take up my business interest, my hamburger business. Yeah. So the headmaster the next year in the school magazine wrote the following. Mr. Mulholland recently, retired recently from the teaching profession. He joined this after Christian Bras in 75 where he taught the general science, GCSE biology and elephant biology. He moved to St. Pat's in 1988. Mr. Mulholland, affectionately known as Lamy, that was my nickname, Lamy, had an affable and easygoing personality. Over the years, he had established a tremendous rapport with students and staff alike. After 17 years in the teaching profession, Mr. Mulholland decided to move on and promote his business interest. A versatile person, he developed uh, a lot of rapport with his pupils. All former students will remember him with great fondness and treasure the humour which he introduced into biology lessons. His open and friendly nice one here. His open and friendly nature had endeared him to students and staff alike, and he will be sadly missed. Not nice. That brings a neat tear to my to my eye. I'm gonna pause this. Right. I'm sorry about that. So, where were we? That was chapter, that was chapter three, wasn't it? Chapter four, uh, my tar business. I told the headmaster, listen, I'll, I'll survive on burgers. The, the, I've enough, wee bit, I've enough money coming in off the burgers to keep my family afloat. And uh, about a year later, I noticed the tar a poor man going up and down past my house to the new development and I went down and seen the guy the, the guy who who the building contractor and uh, he said they uh, were terrible punctures here so I said to myself hmm punctures so I have a scientific brain so I said to myself hmm so I went to a place in Port of Darren that, that re-threads tires and I got little bits of rubber fibre off him and I mixed them up with stuff called poly, polyvinyl acetate that's PVA rust inhibitors um, glues, xanthan gum and all types of chemicals I made it into a lovely lovely gunge right I'm going to show it to you now this is it here this is my, this is my invention a little, if you can see little, little little black spots in it that there is rubber rubber fibre I'm going to pause this to clean my hand 
And the way my product works is whenever the guy gets a puncture, that stuff is inside the tire and the air pressure forces it into the hole and forms a plug, forms a bung. Let me give you a demonstration. Okay, here's a tire. This can be a motor car tire, a lorry tire, a motorbike tire, or a bicycle tire. Okay, I've just punctured it. Yeah, watch. See that? Puncture fixed. If I had brought that on Dragon Stain, <laughs> oh my God, eh? I brought it on Dragon Stain. Formed a company called Super Seal. I used to get a big bed of nails, that's my Jeep, and drive over it. Can you imagine me being in Dragon Stain and coming into Dragon Stain? To, Hello, Dragons, my name's Liam, I'm from, I'm from Northern Ireland. And getting into the car and driving over that big bed of nails and the tire still staying up. Wow, 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 eh? Wouldn't that have been something? Uh, this is different people. This is my brochure. This is my little son, Billy Mulholland. Super Seal has made my bike a super bike. Those are all different contractors who are using the product in their tires. I even, where are we? Yeah, here we go. This is my son, William Joseph. Named after my hero, William Joseph Dunlap. And I call this product Bike Seal Gel. And I've sold lots and lots of that product. Okay. Now, that's the tire business. Now, I don't do it anymore because uh, I used to go around the country and I used to put the paper seal it in all types of machines. Uh, got myself a little van and a little, it's my demonstration wheel. I used to stick big spikes in that and demonstrate it. And all around the country. And it was great. I was free. I was doing my own, my own thing. And at the same time, I'm doing that there, I am still researching science. I still am a biologist at heart. You can take my man out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the man. You can't take the biologist out of me, yeah? And at the same time, I'm getting, I'm reading all sorts of articles on, on, on science. I am, I am a scientist. That's what I am. So uh, I quit teach, uh, I quit the tire business five years ago because it was getting too heavy for me. Far, far too heavy. Sometimes I have to take those big wheels off. To get them fixed properly, blah blah blah, and um, getting, getting too old for it. So I sold the idea to another person. Uh, I have a website up called yourtiredoctor.co.uk. I called myself the Tire Doctor. I had a lovely big boiler suit, the Tire Doctor, on the back of my big boiler suit, the Tire Doctor. And I vaccinate your tires against puncture. <laughs> That's a good one. I vaccinate your tires against puncture. Psst. Amazing. So that was that. So then what I did was after that, I got involved in alternative medicine because I realized that there was a, a lot of people like me who have been harmed by pharmaceutical drugs. And my, I was a junkie, so I, I gradually weaned off. I, I started reading all types of books. This book here probably was the most impressive book I've ever read about mental problems of pharmaceutical drugs and how they can be cured by nutrition. I mean, I have read, I, mean, I, have, I have loads. Every book under the sun, I have read it. So I managed to get myself clean from all sorts of pharmaceutical drugs. And the only product I take now that helps me is CBD oil. CBD oil to me is a godsend. And there's a little, it comes with a little bit of a price. There's a small amount of the psychoactive component in legal CBD oil called THC. And the police are now operating roadside saliva swab tests, rightly so, to check people who um, drink and, and, and drug driving. And unfortunately, someone who's taking CBD oil could feel a roadside test, even though they're, they're perfectly normal and not, there's not psychoactively not affected at all. So there's a guy in another country told me about a product he was making, a natural product, and uh, I am helping him promote that. I have a website up selling, selling Celtic Mist. It's called Celtic Mist, and it helps uh, if you are at work and you're taking legal CBD oil. I don't sell CBD oil, by the way. Um, when I said <clears throat> that I no longer teach, that wasn't really, really true. I still teach. I have been teaching <clears throat> double award science, single double award science, physics, chemistry, biology, for years and years. I still teach my number one subject, which is A-level biology. And the book I use at the moment is this one here. It's the 2019 edition. 
This is the best 75 quid I ever spent in my life. This is a book, if you're going to medical school and want to become a doctor or anyone involved in the medical uh, fraternity, this is the sort of book, this is the one of the top, top books out there. Heart, liver, kidneys, lungs, immune system, lymphatic system, immunology. Uh, chapter 17, where are we? Chapter 17, here we go. In chapters, I don't use any massive big words in, in, in the Ryan teaching on the, uh, on the Facebook because my audience is the people who are not familiar, not familiar with big, I mean, look at that there, that, that there's so, 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 so complicated. Helper T cells, B lymphocytes, and you know, problems, those things are far too complicated for the ordinary person to understand. I keep my things as simple, as simple as possible for you to understand. I still get magazines. I still get the top, top magazines. I keep myself fully, fully <clears throat> educated and up to date with all types of scientific, biological literature. Um, I, my, only, my only mission in life now is to help people, especially people who are suffering from depression, and people from, who are suffering from lack of sleep and anxiety and trauma. Because there's an old saying that I tell people, if you want to know where the rocks are, seal with a sailor who's been shipwrecked. I'll say that again. If you want to know where the rocks are, seal with a sailor who has been shipwrecked. I am a shipwrecked sailor, but I'm on shore now, and I'm, I'm well on dry land. And if I can help anybody, anybody at all, that's my mission in life. I love helping people. I'm going to pause this. Right. I have found a fantastic nutritional product, a German product called Dr. Wolves, and it has helped me immensely. It and CBD oil. The CBD oil keeps my head sane, and the, the, the nutritional the nutrients in the Dr. Wolves product has made a, per, a new man of me. Now, listen, I'm going to show you something here which I'm going to share with you. This is a lady who, who gets Dr. Wolves off me. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I'm doing this. Watch. On the 11th of December, this, this lady is not well, and she, she will know who this is when, I'm, when, when she sees this on, on Facebook. Liam, just dropping me a little line, getting my swarthiness back. People are remarking how well I look. My hair and skin have changed so much. Out in the garden, first time in months. My little piece of heaven at the front of the house is beautiful again. The Tesco man seen the difference and asked when I'm on, and he took your name for Facebook. So did the dial a dog wash lady. Dial a dog wash lady. PNY is even better since I've seen you. All is good and I'm very happy with you and the products. Really enjoying and sharing your posts. Happy. Thank you for giving me my life back. Thank you for giving me my life back. I didn't give her life back. The nutrition gave her, her life back. That is, that makes my, 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 my journeys worthwhile when I get a comment like that there. Yeah. So once again, that's my little, my little video over. Reluctantly, I had to do that. I had to do that there to counter and rebut some false information that's going out there from people who don't know me. And I hope maybe after the, they watch this here, maybe they will understand the, 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 the trauma I went through at the hands of Republican uh, gangsters and how they nearly ended my life. I mean, they planned on killing me. And that's a memory I, Part of my chapter in my life I don't like talking about, but I had, I had to do it for you guys. So I hope you accept everything I have said. Everything I have said to you is 100% true. Honesty is the best policy. Yeah? And that's all I want is honesty. That's why I, when I do my Facebook posts, I just want honest answers. Okay? Thank you.